Thanks for watching how to build a motorcycle frame part three. In parts one and two, we discussed the basics of the frame, the uh, parts of the frame, the mountings, etc. In part two, we discussed frame geometry, stretching, and rake and trail. Uh, in parts one and two, I mentioned that it's a two-part series, but uh, the reason I said that is because part three was going to be a little more technical, and uh, frankly, I couldn't find a way to make it um, interesting to watch and listen to because it gets a little bit technical and boring, but uh, I think I found a way to make it a little more interesting because the, the information is helpful, uh, in my opinion, and I, I think you'll find it helpful in your build. At least you'll build your knowledge and be able to discuss intelligently how I've motorcycle frame or a chopper frame is built. Um, the last thing I want to mention is that this is not a Steven Spielberg production, as I mentioned in the last two videos. I'm not a professional speaker, and I will be reading from information we created here at customchoppersguide.com. Uh, but once again, I think you'll find the information helpful and even valuable um, in your next build. So let's move forward, starting with the uh, raw materials. The main frame component is tubing. Tubing is measured by its size on the outside, so 1.25 inch tubing has an outer diameter of 1.25 inches. Piping, on the other hand, used for plumbing is measured by the inside size, so 1.25 inch piece of pipe would be fatter than a similarly labeled tubing. Frames can be made of piping, but it's very bad. They are going to end up very heavy, and quite simply, the material is wrong for the job. Don't confuse massive weight with strength. You should be able to carry the frame reasonably easily when you finish, because it should weigh about 40 pounds up to uh, even 100 pounds. Cold rolled electric resistance welded steel, CREW crew as it's called, is the standard choice, but there are other materials you could use. Chrome moly is an option for the tubing, but it is more expensive, probably unnecessarily so. For components like lugs, the forward control adapters, for example, the slightly more expensive seamless steel known as drawn over mandrel or DOM will be needed. DOM can be used throughout the chassis, but again, it pushes the price uh, unnecessarily high. Needless to say, each builder will have his or her own ideas on the right material for the job. There are various tubing diameters that you can use safely, though most bikes are built from between 1.2 to 1.25 inch diameter crew with a wall thickness of between 0.095 and 0.120 inch. I told you it's a little bit technical and boring. <laughs> to get a good mixture of weight and strength, the wall strength can be increased in the center post and backbone while keeping the same outer diameter tubing, yet with a thinner wall for the rest of the frame. You could use 1.25 inch diameter with a thickness of 0.095 inch for everything, but the center post and backbone, then a 0.120 inch wall thickness for these parts. The larger tubes of one and a half inch diameter will make for a heavy chassis if you use the same wall thickness, but the larger tubing is easier to cut and weld for less experienced fabricators. When you decide on the diameter and type of tubing, you'll need to buy two 20-foot stretches. Needless to say, not all suppliers offer the same quality merchandise, and you're looking for material that has been looked after. You should expect it to be clean and rust-free, straight and dent-free. So I hope that made uh, sense. If not, you can email us at customchoppersguide.com. The tools for the job. There is an enormous amount of equipment that can be used in frame manufacture. If you get a chance to go to a medium-sized workshop, you'll see all sorts of exciting equipment if equipment excites you. Here we'll stick to the basics. A saw, this is just to cut tubing, so a hacksaw works. However, better saws, uh, better cuts from a tubing cutter, a jigsaw, or a recipro reciprocal saw um, are what you should get if you can afford it. This uh, saw, saw, reciprocating saw uh, is quite good, and it has very good reviews. And I think you can get it for about $99, or you can borrow one from a friend. <laughs> for the... Measuring and setting equipment, a plumb bob will be needed to find a to, will be needed to find vertical along with a good quality steel tape to measure tubing lengths and so on. 
for the more accurate work, you need a machinist square with the level and calibrations in small fractions of an inch, imperial 30 seconds and 60 fourths, and metric hundredths of an inch, and some accurate calipers. You will also need an angle finder for accurately setting the angles in assembly. Something like a felt tip pen will do for marking off measurements on the tubing. Something to cope or notch the tubing. This is the tool that makes the notch in the end of the tubing prior to welding to another tube. Welding the down tube to the head tube, for example. It needs to make a cut that is the shape of the tube excuse me, it needs to make a cut that is the shape of the tube it's going to be welded onto and to make that cut at the correct angle so the two parts fit snugly before welding. This is an example of a uh, fairly expensive tube notcher. You can find it at medfordtools.com. I think it's around $260, but you can, uh, you can find notchers anywhere from $100 to $150 that will do the job, maybe cheaper on eBay. But uh, the job can be done with an angle grinder set on a bench and some modif modifications, but this needs a lot of skill. So don't do it if you've never done it before. Um, but like I said, there are specific tools like notchers, and uh, this is the higher end notcher that uh, you might want to check out. A tubing bender, it's it's possible to bend pipe by hand if the pipe is long, so you can get leverage and you don't care too much about the exact shape. All you need is to do s is uh, something to wedge the pipe. However, you're looking for something with much more accuracy that will work on already cut short tubing. It needs to be something specifically designed to bend like tubing, not something that bends pipes. The benders specifically designed for bending plumbing pipes that are based around a bottle jack aren't much good because they won't allow tight enough bends. You'll need to bend around part of a circle that measures three to five inches. Imagine the bending mold, which is only a section of a circle made into a full circle. The radius of this imagined circle is the bend radius. A good tubing bender will be around $500. You can get them cheaper. And with $1,000, you should be able to get a really good hydraulic tube bender. This JDU tubing bender um, is very good. You can go to JDU, JD2, I believe, .com or do a search online. <clears throat> Check on the specs that it does in terms of the tubing bender tubing bender, check on the specs that it does what you need it to do, that it has capacity for all the size tubing you'll be using. For different size tubing, you'll need different size molds or dies so the tubing nestles comfortably while being bent. Often the dies are called mandrels, though strictly speaking that's something you put inside the tube to improve the post bending shape and which we won't need. You can also build a tubing bender we have plans for this uh, tubing bender at customchoppersguide.com. Um, so if you like to build your own equipment, that might be something to look into. So the next tool um, is a frame jig. This is what molds the tubing lightly in place. Excuse me. It's what holds the tubing lightly in place at the correct angles while it's being welded. A chopper frame can be built without a jig, and some top custom builders do just that. But they are top builders, not beginners. Most builders consider a jig vital, and it probably isn't essential for a beginner. They can be quite basic if you are building a bicycle, which is flatter and lighter than a chopper frame or a motorcycle frame. A marked out piece of plywood with a few bits of shelving bracket would be more than enough to do a fairly good job. This jig, uh, is by BCC Orlando. Uh, you can get plans at customchoppersguide.com for that specific frame jig. Or you can get plans and build your own to build one like this. They will both do the job. If you want to spend thousands of dollars on a shiny adjustable jig that will do the job, you can do that. It's also possible to build your own, like I said, which we'll talk about and which we have talked about. The problem is that this takes time and money. 
more of both than uh, building the frame itself. So if money is no object, then you might want to just buy a jig. There are many types of jigs available. What is usually just referred to as a frame jig is designed for holding all the metal work of the frame in place for a given bike. In other words, it's useful for the frame only. A custom builder's jig usually takes all the components, wheel, motor, and transmission as well. So the frame can be built around these bits. This helps in ensuring that they all fit well because you have all the parts in front of you as you fabricate the machine. And finally, there are the jig there are the parts of the jigs which are made which are simply used for bits and pieces like fabricating the wishbone and down to before bringing them together with the rest of the frame. There are many types of jigs, basic flat plate, modified flat plate, parallels, beams jig, compact plate jig, bottom up jig, external jig, to name but a few. Here we'll just talk about the basics that you will need to complete the job. The building of a jig is a chance to stretch your ingenuity. Not all jigs need to be the same. The first thing that all jigs need is a solid base that is true, perfectly level. This doesn't in itself have to be high tech and can be metal girders stacked on blocks or set on perfectly level workbench. Some jigs are vertical and you build the bike as though it was balanced on its back wheel. But I find it easier to visualize the bike in the position it is going to end up being ridden. Next, you will need some fixed points of reference for putting the bike together, such as fixed tubes for sliding the neck tube onto, fixed at the correct angle, and for mounting the axle points. Also, you need to remember that once the frame is welded, it needs to come off the jig to become a street-going vehicle. Don't jam it in place with an immovable axle mount and an angled neck support strut. <clears throat> Necessary tool, of course, to weld your your frame is a uh, TIG welder. You, a, a MIG welder will do the job, but TIG is preferred. And let's go over a summary of the basic tools for the job. A saw, any good straight saw, or you can use a reciprocal saw as described. A grinder, a uh, four inch hand grinder, grinder medium grade. A tubing bender, JD2, JD2 bend, excuse me, JD2 tube bender is a recommended one you can buy or you can build your own as described. A tubing notcher, sometimes depending on the finished placement and overall size, you can use a lathe, but in most cases where good tubing is a necessary fit, you use a tube notcher or a fish mouth tool. A good hand grinder will finish things off nice. And last but not least, for the basic, bare basic tools for the job of putting a motorcycle frame or a chopper frame together, building one, a TIG welder is preferred, but MIG will do. Stay with pure argon for either. Shops that make large numbers of frames will have a set of pre-bent tubes and other essentials set aside in bins. They physically and mentally separate prep work from assembly. And it's not a bad idea for the first time builder since you need different attitudes for the big cuts and bends and for the fine work. In a, f in a first building job, it's important not to rush. Use lots of mock-ups before committing yourself and measure at least twice. Don't rely solely upon measuring instrumentation. Use the metal in front of you wherever possible. Prep work. So get your plans, your tools, and your raw materials in a sensible order. Start out bending and cutting the metal. The basic list will be something like this. Uh, one backbone, maybe uh, two bottom rails, long pieces with several bends, one center post, two wishbones, some cross struts, etc. Next stems can be made from DOM, DOM tubing, which we discussed, which unlike crew has a seam free interior, excuse me, interior. But, and also, also, they can also be bought as complete kits with bearings. This is fairly expensive and it's a recommendable option. 
Similarly, the mounting plates for the transmission and the motor can be machined. But let me give you an example uh, of a Nextem kit, I guess you could call it. And I found this on eBay. This is an example. The eBay seller is Badman14. Uh, that's what a Nextem kit might look like. But like I said, the uh, mounting plates for the transmission and the motor can be machined if you have the skill and time, but can uh, you can also buy pre-machined transmission plates like this, for example. I found again this one on eBay. The uh, seller's name is Sam Powers Sport at Sports One. That's just an example. With the plans in hand, mark up the tubing for cutting and bending. Leave some extra inches, about two inches at each end. When making the first cuts, since the tubing needs to be fine fitted, etc. Bending, even with the right equipment, isn't, it's not easy to get the right the first time. Possibly you'll not be able to see the scale telling you what angle uh, you're at while you're in the process of making the bend, so you have to keep stopping to check. More importantly, metal doesn't behave like modeling clay. It has elastic properties and spring back will take place. This means you have to bend a bit. You have to bend a bit more than you need because the metal will return to a slightly larger angle when it's out of the bender. This might not happen immediately, which is why even in professional shops, they often have to do a little further precise bending in the assembly stage. Unbending is close to impossible, however, so you're best to take a gradual approach to bending, particularly until you have a good feel for the metal's bending properties. This feel comes with experience. The other thing to note when working with metal is that warm metal changes size. It expands as it heats. This is crucial to remember when doing the fine grinding to get the final fit. The grinder heats the metal up and makes it makes you over measure by small but important fractions of an inch. Wait for the metal to cool between fittings. Obviously the effect is greater on the smaller pieces like struts, but the physics is the same on the metal parts you work. The finished miter needs blunt edges rather than sharp ones in order to successfully weld later on. You're looking for flat contact between the cut edges and the tube it will attach to, so the whole thickness of the cut tube is in contact, not just a thin, knife-like profile. For this reason, don't use a 1.25 hole saw, hole saw fitting on a 1.25 tube, but choose a slightly smaller diameter. Welding. Welding is a skill that comes from being taught. It's a, it's a difficult skill to learn from a book, from practice, and from continual use. Many welders will tell you that their standard falls away sharply if they aren't practicing regularly. So if you can't weld at all, it's probably not a good idea to learn on a motorcycle or chopper frame. If you can weld, there are a number of things that can be done to maximize the chances of producing acceptable quality work. Preparation is vital. The pieces to be welded should be fit smoothly together before being welded. Bear in mind that there is shrinkage during welding. You're melting, a re you're, you're melting and remaking the metal, so allow a small amount extra. When welding, employ a pattern just like you would when fitting an automobile wheel, tightening alternate nuts. Tack weld the whole frame in place. Then when you're happy, start with a quarter weld on any particular joint. Then switch to the matching joint on the opposite side of the bike and do the corresponding quarter. The aim is to balance the welding so you go along to minimize any frame twisting or movement. This can be done in or out of the jig depending on the type of jig and your personal preference. Preparation is vital. So plan for the job. If you're going to build the frame, you're going to need some money and a lot of time. There are some basic things to bear in mind about a project like this that should increase your chances of success. Set yourself some goals that are reasonable and achievable. Make them the kind of thing you'll notice when you've done it. So don't set your goals, don't set your only goal as in six months time I'll have a finished frame. This is just too long a time scale and doesn't make you do something this week. It allows you to put things off. Instead, think out the intermediate stages like 
I'll have the metal bent by next Tuesday, or I'm going to have the jig finished by the end of this month. Once you start thinking like this, you break the tasks down into manageable chunks. So you'll be thinking of the job as the stages you need to undertake and how long they take. If this sounds like a hassle, just imagine having some tubes of metal lying around in your workshop for six years. Our goal is to keep moving, keep up the momentum. I know I've talked about um, quite a few things in this. It was got a little bit technical, maybe a little bit boring, and we talked about some uh, welding technique and uh, bending, but uh, I think you'll find that helpful. You might want to watch this video again. Um, if you want specific video tutorials um, and guides on how to weld and um, building a frame, I highly recommend Ron Covell's Building a Chopper Chassis and any, any of his metalworking and welding uh, DVD guides. They're just phenomenal, and uh, we do carry uh, most of his at customchoppersguide.com. But you can also find them for sale on Amazon and uh, other sources. But I also want to give you an example of uh, a backyard build, believe it or not. This custom chopper right here, this red one, was built by... Uh, Ron Bowman in Virginia, he's, he's a recent subscriber and he sent in some really cool pictures of his bike build, literally built it in his backyard. And I want to thank you once again for uh, watching How to Build a Motorcycle Frame Part 3. I hope it, w hope it was helpful. Let me know. And I look forward to making more videos such as this. Please go to our YouTube channel for more uh, bike building and welding videos. You can also find them at customchoppersguide.com.